Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Interconnect 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Las Vegas for theCUBE here at Mandalay Bay for IBM Interconnect. This is part of the Go Social Experience, part of the big conference. We're bringing social media, social business, social, me social content. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, founder of wikibon.org. Uh, our next guest is Stefan Ferber, VP of Engineering at Bosch Software Innovations. Welcome to theCUBE. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having us, we're live, we're yeah. pumping it out all, all around the world. So first, tell the folks out there before we get into some of the conversations around the Internet of Things, cloud, what all this is happening. What's Bosch software about? What, what do you do there? Uh, obviously, VP Engineering, you, you manage coders and all that good stuff. What are you guys doing? What, tell, talk about Bosch and then we can get into the conversation. Yeah, we founded um, the software and system house within Bosch in 2008 to uh, enable us in the Internet of Things and conquer this world. Uh, the software innovations is uh, providing a software platform for Bosch business units to connect their things, their product to the market. But we also offer this for third parties, for partner business. And as we believe in an open platform approach, uh, we also believe that IBM and us will play an important role in this future. So talk about the, uh, the company, global in size, presence, so all around the world, certain geographies is the consumption model, regional, global, can you explain some of that? Yeah, we are growing by acquisitions. Now actually we are in the third phase of another acquisition we just announced on Monday. So it's uh, just a week ago. We started in 2008 uh, with a company in Germany, Lake Constance, very nice place by the way. If you go vacationing there, it should be there. <laughs> okay. Then another uh, Java company in Berlin. Uh, now we bought a company located in Cologne in Sofia. And we outreach now to Chicago here in the US. Uh, in Singapore is our Asian hub. We have also an office in Shanghai. Though we are still a startup with around yeah, 600, 700 people. Uh, it's we a, it's are a small startup. <laughs> yeah, not, not For Bosch it's really a startup <laughs> amongst these uh, nearly 300,000 employees. It's just a small entity in the Bosch Well, Uber's family. a startup and they just raised a billion dollars worth a trillion. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the question that everyone's never mind. Letting big companies act nimble and agile, like small companies, and make small companies feel big is kind of the theme of this new way. Cloud powers that. Yeah. But one of the things that we talk about in theCUBE is this global consumption. The need to be global from day one. Yeah. Global first is the term yeah, you know, that. we coined here yeah. in theCUBE. Um, uh, mobile first, kicked around cloud first, but global first. What's the global view from an engineering standpoint? Is it challenging? What are you guys doing? Well, IoT, if you look at the markets, is strong in the US, it's strong in Europe, and strong in, in Asia. So, uh, if you miss one of these markets, you have you had trouble from the early beginning. So, <laughs> you need some footprint, of course, and with our brand, we are, of course, strong in Germany and Europe. But we also see a lot of traction we get here in the US, and in Asia, it's also an easy win as we are very strongly growing there. So, so IoT, I mean, it's, it's so big. I mean, it so, touches so many parts of our lives. So, in that sense, we can relate to it. On the other hand, there's just so much to it. So, how does Bosch look at the Internet of Things? Maybe take us back to the sort of beginning of when you guys started, yeah. thinking it probably wasn't called IoT back then. Um, no, we pretty early called it that way. Internet of Things and Service was the first yeah, one, okay. but we skipped the service So what, what time frame is this? Um, the initial discussion internally we had starting 2005. Okay. And the question was what would happen if all our Bosch products are connected to the Internet? How this will change our business? How, how we have to adapt technology-wise? And uh, then we had a long discussion, do we, are we going to do this ourselves with the software? We have a lot of embedded software. Out of these 40,000 engineers, we have 15,000 software developers in the Bosch Group. But most of them do embedded work. And IoT is, is embedded, but it's much more. It's also distributed networks, uh, it's Java development, JavaScript, it's web pages, it's databases, it's uh, M2M. So we thought, okay, we have to have a footprint in this market, and that's why we started our own company, understanding this business. So, the early discussions back in the mid-2000s, what was the impetus? Was it predictive maintenance? Was it consumer behavior? Um, when, you know, at what point when did, did privacy inject into the discussion? Yeah, yeah. Talk about that. The, uh, 
we have a very generic view on that. Each product is associated with a service in the future. It can be predictive maintenance, it can be improving the product, it can be even linking this product to others with new functionality behind. Uh, so we see ourselves to be also a service company in the future and is software as a service aligned with the product. And predictive maintenance is, I think, is a no-brainer. You can see in particular in production and uh, expensive assets on the road. But there are many more, making things easier to use, uh, understanding how people using your product is also motivation. Um, insights. Yeah, insights yeah. From, from that. And if you look at the market of insights, how people are really using things is a bigger market than advertisement. And so there's a lot of opportunities out there if you have the data and the connectivity. So the idea germinated, say, in 2005. How did you get, and then you made the decision, let's do much of this in-house, yeah. maybe do some partnerships, and I'm sure you had some open source discussions. Which yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. So, okay, so what, what came next? Is, okay, now let's get a team, and yeah, we, do, we do some experiments? Or? We started in some verticals to, to be early mover. Uh, one Where was, did you start? We started with a project in Singapore, electromobility. You see, if you have electric cars, charging station, drivers, uh, the scarcity of charging station, you have to park and charge at the same time, you need reservation, you need billing, you need payment. We thought, okay, that's a good thing for a startup. Look at smaller projects where connectivity is a must, you cannot do this differently. And uh, we won this uh, project in Singapore to provide the infrastructure. And from there we gained. So we did the first uh, installation of our platform, we learned from that. Then we acquired another company that brought VPM uh, along with that, uh, because we know that a lot of processes being run automatically. And if you do, if you collect sensor data, and we produce uh, three and a half million sensors every day, if you consume this manually with people, there's no way. You, know, you need really automated processes in the backyard uh, to take over the data and make business sense out of that. And this learning, uh, yeah, I, I think will continue with each project we do. But the good thing is we have products out. So there's a heating system being connected since 2009 with an, uh, with an iPhone app. Um, it's also a lawnmower, a robot lawnmower coming to the market just these days. We have uh, electric bicycles being connected. So there are many products already in the market, but you can see IoT make exchange already. So at some point somebody said, well how are we going to make money at this? What's the business What's model? the business model, yeah. <laughs> right, so we'll talk about It's an interesting business. part. For, for companies who used to build products, it's a change in business model because the service alone, you cannot really pay up front. Uh, you have performance-based pricing or fee or subscription. These are the business model usually uh, suitable for these kinds of products. Traditional companies have their problems with that. And um, that's why we started um, a lab at the uh, Hochschule St. Gallen in Switzerland. This is a real expert university on business models and IoT. And there we have now 10 PhD students they write a thesis and their goal is to start a company with this business model. So we're combining this, uh, it's also the pushing, pushing our organization to a new business model with this expertise. So, so specifically, how do you make money in the IoT business? Is it a subscription base? Is yeah, the description is something you usually solution? always have in there, but uh, we see that we have to grow with our customers. So that is uh, risk sharing also behind this. So we have business model on the numbers of things being connected, the numbers of transactions you have. So once the growth is coming, and our customers also making more money, we're also then taking more revenue out of that. Uh, this is, I think, the general pattern. Behind. So it's kind of an elastic yeah. pricing and revenue model. Yeah. And uh, the traditional model that I get all the money when I sell the product, uh, I think this will, will die sooner or later. Now, what about open source? What, where does open source fit in? Um, I want to talk about anything you do, might be doing with IBM there, but let's start yeah. with the open source question. Uh, open source plays an important role. We believe in an open platform. It doesn't make sense to build an Internet of Things platform for Bosch. It <laughs> should be for all things around the, around the planet. Uh, but we want to have some, uh, some ways of steering the development of this platform. We want to co-evolve this with partners. And of course, in the strategic points, we want to know what's going on. Like privacy, we want to know where the data is. We want to know how the policies of data uh, com combination and, and uh, distribution is. That's why we believe in open source as a business model also, but also we, open, we have a lot of open source technology in our software anyhow. We are a member of Eclipse. Of course, uh, most of our gateways are, are Linux operated. 
uh, we are a Java company, and this, I, I always assume, is part of a community-based uh, programming language. And this has a lot of uh, similarities with what I see with also with IBM. Uh, we are strong, strongly founded on OSGI technology, also something IBM has been doing for many years. Um, all of our tooling is basically heading to Eclipse in automotive, but also for IoT tooling. And uh, Eclipse plugins are just the way to go. So, talk more about your relationship with IBM. I mean, I know Bosch, a big company, I'm sure you buy a lot of mainframes from IBM, but specifically as it relates to the, the software side of the organization. What are you doing with IBM? Yeah, so um, one of the areas that is uh, interesting to look at in the embedded world is that if you build embedded systems, they are a lot of uh, variants of each other. Usually we build platforms, and out of these platforms we derive software pieces, and engine control software is an excellent example. There we produce 20 million engine control units per year, and uh, they go to different customers. Each customer has a different car. So we have 400 projects in parallel running, uh, being supported by three and a half thousand Bosch engineers, and this to manage this with, uh, with software, configuration management, collaboration, and this 1,500 variation points behind this. This is done with the uh, IBM product line engineering solution, PLE, and this is really co-evolving activity. Our work in product line uh, and IBM's work there, we co-innovate basically this product and we're happy to help IBM to bring this to other companies in the automotive domain as we see that if this effort is spreading around, this also helps us cooperating with our uh, customers and partners. So when you say co-innovate, you mean you bring engineering resources, IBM brings engineering resources yeah. and you create solutions together? Actually all the, the new features in PLE are derived together. I wouldn't say that all the features coming from Bosch, but I think the most innovative one they we're providing, and knowing what's important in that business, I think it's uh, also key value for you folks at IBM. So, how does this all translate into actual activities in the business? So, Stefan, if I had to say, look at look at Bosch, an enormous company, huge product portfolio. How? much of its portfolio is Internet of Things enabled. Is ah, it? okay, as of today. Yeah, yeah for, and where is that going? Our, our CEO, Mr. Denner, is, is very clear on that. He wants to see a plan for each product when it's online. It's not a question if, it's just a question one at the right time. Okay. And if you look at some very uh, tiny or very inexpensive products, the time is a little bit later, but if you see uh, the important assets, it's much earlier, like our robot lawnmower, it's around $1,000. Of course you can make this an online uh, experience. Uh, connect this to iPhone, do remote, uh, remotely start your loan mowing, setting up calendar times when it should mow and it shouldn't, depending on weather and all these things you like uh, as you don't like to spend the time on your grass. Uh. So this is there, uh, already here. And some other products I think maybe five, year, five more years, but you don't know. You hit the inflection point in Internet of Things and we are prepared, we're just waiting for when it's the right time for a product business-wise to go online, and then we, we go out. And what about, we talked about privacy a little bit before, a um, couple things, well, first of all, you're in Germany, which is very strict about where data can go, yeah. so presumably you have to leave all the data yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, in Germany, but, but how are you handling privacy? Is it an opt-in model for the consumer, for example, your lawnmower example? Um, how does that all work? Yeah, we want to make this very transparent. We believe that trust is an important uh, ingredient in the Internet of Things. All this will not unfold if people do not trust these systems and that we handle their data in a trustful way. Uh, then there's no innovation, there's no data, and then there's no value behind. So we allow each customer to decide which kind of data they want to share with us and which they don't. So this is very transparent to them. Um, of course, then some business models are not possible, like sending advertisement uh, to them is not available anymore, which is okay for us, because we believe that the product and the, the service itself has its value, and it's basically price, and if you do something on the side, uh, okay, you can do that, but it's not the main purpose of our business. Our main purpose is invented for life, and it's improving lives of people, and not sending advertisement to people that, that they didn't want to see. So. So, are you doing anything with, um, talk about data a little bit. Talk about, the, you know, we, we were just at uh, 
the Hadoop world last week. We've been doing Hadoop, John and I, and the Cube for a long time, okay. you know, focusing on an area. What do you What do you do with all that data? Are you using uh, things like Hadoop? Um, where does that fit into the whole strategy? Yeah, storing the data is an issue by itself. Um, we use all kind of technology. So if I look around, I'm always amazed that I find something new. So we have, of course, Hadoop. Mm -hmm. We have MongoDBs running around. We have IBM databases, Oracle databases. So basically, it's a variety of data storage, and each of them has its own value. Like if you go to uh, NoSQL databases, MongoDB is a good example. Yeah, you, of course, we have that. But one thing is to store the data. This is actually the easier part. Taking out the data and making sense out of that, it's a more difficult part. We have a partnership with Nine, that's a small company uh, uh, located in, uh, it's all in Germany, in Switzerland, and the US, uh, for an, an open analytics platform to make more value out of the data, because in the end, it's not sufficient that we only have these highly skilled data analytic guys who can make sense out of the data. We need about, uh, yeah, five million IoT developers to do all these applications, and they must be able to do analytics in the daily base. And that's why we are looking for the Swiss army knife of big data analytics, so that 80 or 90% of the big questions can be answered by a typical engineer. And all the very tough and more, the last maybe one or 2% we go to data analytics people. So John and I are always talking about the developers as, as you know the, the linchpin, yeah. really. How are you, what's the message to developers? How are you attracting them? You got publish an API, maybe we could talk yeah. about that a little bit. Uh, we just published in December uh, an Eclipse IoT project called Wattle, that's the interface to things. Uh, that's an approach where you generate specific platform uh, drivers for, uh, for refrigerator, security camera, or car, based on a common uh, abstraction language. We see there's some traction behind. Uh, we just announced this in the Eclipse conference uh, in Ludwigsburg last year. And we see that a lot of company jumping on board, and I hope also IBM is joining us. I had a lot of discussion here on the conference about that. Uh, they haven't seen this yet, so it needs a lot of education. Uh, but uh, I think uh, this is the way we go, that we have one common API to all things. This is what openness yeah. really means. Yeah. And then all the developers, they don't have to care whether this is a Bosch device or a GE device or somebody else. They can uh, start doing so, the application so on top of So choice for customers is a big thing. That comes up, so yeah. you know, cloud is great, but it's happening in the open. Blue Mix is developing fast. What do you see for cloud? I mean, OpenStack's out there. Can you comment on infrastructure as a service, platforms as a service? Where are the work areas that you think yeah. need to get done to move the ball down faster yeah. uh, towards getting to the goals of the customer outcomes? The infrastructure as a service, we rather source from somebody. So mm -hmm. actually, we we are agnostic there. We just need the resources, of course. We need the, the network. We need the, uh, the storage and also the compute. On platform as a service, we are adding some ingredients that are related to managing the devices out there, uh, having uh, security there, uh, and also we have some nice technology about rules engine. We bring this in there, and also we have uh, BPM technology. We think we can leverage there. And then on top, the real innovation happens in software as a service. Something a B2C consumer is really interested in to, to buy as a fee or performance-based pricing. Or even B2B customers like predictive maintenance for a specific machine com uh, integrated into the business process. This is our main revenue source on, on, on that stack. What does systems of engagement mean to you, that term? Especially the Internet of Things could be a a probe, a sensor, a human being, yeah. connected to a mobile device, real time. What's some of these concepts? Yeah. How does that translate down to what's under the hood? Yeah, if you look at the whole user experience world, it's so interesting now because you have a smartphone, maybe a variable, you have a computer screen, laptops, PCs, you have an operator, and you have the thing itself. So there are so many ways you can interact uh, with the service and the thing. It's a little bit indistinguishable in the end and the whole industry, design, computer, UX, UI stuff, this all comes to a new arena. Mm. Uh, and making this a seamless, up to somebody you call the operator, and the operator is able, yeah, I know, your device is here, it's in this situation. Uh, getting this as one smooth user experience, this is a tremendous task for, for engineers and also designers. So this is uh, something we are working on, we want to 
push our brand in front because this would be seamless. How do you handle the cultural shift that's happening with um, companies and then employees and engineers where the, the new theme is open source, it's all out done in the open, but you got a business that has made, might have some legacy, and also getting engineers closer to the customer action. It used to be keep them in the back room yeah, and code exactly. away, <laughs> and now design, iteration, Region. agile design, not just being graphics design, but like design and customer experience with real time. There's real sensitivity towards relevancy and fast. It's fast time to value. So how do you how do you deal with that? Like you give them training, you bring the engineers out in front of customers, is it a mindset? How and and if do engineers get close to the customers? Yeah, user experience is a lot about mindset. So we have a, a sort of own academy for this topic. We're going through trainings, this is something. But it, I think it's rather the awareness training that it's important. The way you do it, you rather do this in the concrete projects. And having success in a concrete example, like in our e-bike situation, we have a very nice navigation computer now, it's called Neon. And if you see this, everybody within Bosch understands, yeah, this is the way we should go. And this is are the lighthouse projects that steer the whole company forward. Um, what, what, so about, what about Blue Mix? What does Blue Mix mean to you in terms of their evolution? Where are they in their journey? A lot of times developers are like, well, I'm comfortable with Amazon if, it, if you're born in the cloud, or if you're in the data center, no, no I don't want to do the cloud security. Is there new things that you see yeah, that are I really forcing developers saying, okay, I can take that step and put my toe in the water? I think uh, I, was, I was very early on seeing Blue Mix. It was the day before the CBIT opened in Hannover Fair two and, a, <laughs> two and a half years ago. I saw the first demonstration and I thought that's the way we should go. And if you look at the concept we have for our IoT platform, it, it's very much this idea that you have microservices, you, 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 you mesh them up to an application, uh, you have multiple uh, companies providing their service on one platform. I think that's the, exactly the right way to go. Do you think there's an opportunity to actually monetize the data that you're collecting? Is that something that yeah, you guys course. talk about? Yeah, of course. There are interesting models now behind. You always are think you that doing that already? Or? Yeah, we, we data we, as a service? We, we uh, offer data services, analytics service, this is something. So we know, we have domain expertise, we know how, how to do its work, and also we have analytics capabilities. So. Uh, if you look for production, for example, we have uh, ourselves 250 plants worldwide. We know exactly how to analyze data from production shop floor. And this we can offer to other companies, and we do this. As uh, what, for, why do they buy it? For benchmark purposes? Or? It can be benchmark, can be predictive maintenance, can be, please give me a model that I understand how much testing I need at the end of the line for a specific product, depending on the parameters of production. It can be on, uh, should I sh uh, ship this product or not? Uh, so it can be multiple things. Uh, the, the data itself is more interesting because today we don't have really a data market. If you look at the business model the, the internet company currently have, I always refer to as a black market. You give your data and you get software for free and the, you don't pay taxes. That's the definition for a black market. You don't pay taxes for, uh, for something you get. Uh, you have to get out of that. It should be as transparent as buying a car. What is the value of data? Who has it? Is, it? is it really anonymously? Is it aggregated? This is the kind of information you need, the transparency behind. Do you, do you feel, Stefan, like Bosch is a cutting edge uh, player in IoT um, relative to your competition? I mean, where do you, how do you guys size up your own sort of internal competitive? Well, posture? I can claim we started very early thinking about this. I think also from the traditional companies, we are early mover. Uh, here in the US, I see GE also in a similar situation. Yeah. And we are pushing for this, and if I see all the, the support I get from, from our board, from our CEO, uh, to move forward there, it's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm very confident there, but the internet is a very fast business, and it's always a question whether a company that is more than 125 years old is able to take up the pace and, and, and move there. It's too, it's too, too, so you, you have resources, yeah. but it's sometimes you have, it's slower to make decisions, but I mean, Bosch as a as a global player. You mentioned you mentioned GE, obviously IBM with Smarter Planet. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of respects, they are the ones who are going to drive Internet of Things. 
Uh, of course, then you've got the developer ecosystem that you're trying yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to appeal to. And some new startups. Let's see what's coming out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. So what about, open, what about also. open source? How are you yeah. guys looking at open source? So we were commenting earlier, actually someone picked up our tweet, open source is probably the movement of the century that's changed the society, the yeah, world. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm and a strong believer in open source. In particular, the internet wouldn't happen without open source. Right. And I'm pretty sure open source wouldn't be there without internet also. Because and otherwise now, you cannot really uh, cooperate that easily uh, across the globe. Yeah, but open source used to be we used to be we used to be renegades fighting for freedom. Now it's standard. Open source is now tier one, first class citizen. Is a first class citizen? Yeah, yes. it's, it truly is. It's all yeah. awesome, right? It's, yeah. it's generations of layers of improvement, standing on the shoulders of others before you is, the, is always the phrase. Um, but it's now it's impacting business models, the federations of yeah. uh, federated um, groups. Um, does this concern you? you? Worries you at all? Are you happy with it? I mean, it's affecting business. I mean, we're open source media. We heard Power has an yeah. open a Power Systems group here at IBM. It's had great success. Over a hundred partners, and they're a new open source kind of movement towards hardware. Open compute in the data center. We've seen yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. So yeah, I mean, cool. does it stop? No, I don't, no. I don't <laughs> think it won't stop. Yeah, first of all, the IoT will also be only possible with open source. I'm pretty sure. And uh, of course, for for a traditional player like Bosch, it's a learning curve until we have all the lawyers, all the business people and controlling people understand what value capturing is all about. It's a completely new for them. It's the educational part. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be here with our software we have today without open source. It's pretty clear. Yeah. And, and we're pushing this farther. And the question is how you, you build up ecosystem that do the right thing. And this is, you cannot really control. You just can ask and, and Ask where's the next? To join and, and where's the next wave? Obviously, Internet of Things is a big wave. People are saying that's yeah. the wave. It's very bubbly right now. Yeah. Obviously, certain the consumer side, you see Uber and whatnot, um, companies going public. But in the enterprise, there's a lot of waves coming. We were we've been speculating on the cube here that yeah. folks watching know that we believe that you know, it might be high valuations, but innovations here. Wave it's usually that waves come in sets. Is Internet of Things the next wave? And what other waves might be out there that people might not see? We're hearing all kinds of things about machine learning getting easier, yeah. talking about um, in-memory kind of transactional things, coders Sweet. doing better things, more library automation, orchestration. This is all buzzwords, but that's reality. What's next? What do you see the next waves? Uh, I think the waves will be a little bit anticipated in specific markets, like smart home, we yeah. believing is catching off. The CES here in Las Vegas was a clear indicator that this is going to happen now. People now are so used to their smartphones, and uh, even youngsters, they don't believe if it's some software, it's in a dishwasher, why I cannot use my, my magic wand, yeah. my smartphone, to, to access the dishwasher. Yeah. It's also a generation topic, but yeah. maybe for us. There's a lot of data exhaust, um, yeah. too, coming out. <laughs> in the market for a dishwasher, and you know. It is. <laughs> <a, laughs> this conversation's really swaying. You got to clean <laughs> the data, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you, gotta, you got garbage disposal, you got to get, get rid of the, uh, the trash, the bad data, the yeah, good data. Yeah. So, so the exhaust of data coming from this is, is off the charts, right? So I got to ask you, you know, people talk about data lake, it's kind of like a data warehousing concept. Um, yeah, of course you can, you can take all the data out and store it somewhere, but I think it makes sense to analyze the data locally first and really aggregate it in a way that you make sense out of that. Like sending out temperature information from, from this yeah. building uh, every one second, is, does it really have value? No, it doesn't. So you really look at what I'm interested in. Uh, temperature peak might be interesting, somebody opened a window or something. Wild variation. Something like yeah. that. Right. So this is something, you have to put more brains behind the data, and this has to be locally, yeah. not only in the cloud. But it's diverse too, there's different use cases, different architectures, yeah. especially Internet of Things. Doug Baylog was saying, you know, one of the, the key conversations that they're creating, that they're joining and they're enabling, is one of them is drowning in data, these insights model. Okay. You know, people drown, people can drown of many things. Companies can drown with too much data, different not being prepared for data. Yeah. So. Are there, will, the, will there be more deaths for the corporations out there in the drowning of big data in the lake or the ocean? <laughs> okay. What do you the, think? Which one end? will have more casualties? Lake or the ocean? I think it's just a business question in the end, <laughs> how much money you spend on the lake or the ocean. Yeah. Statistically, and more people die in the ocean <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than the lakes. But, but lake, lake is a term that's been kicked around. We're, we, we're talking about a new term called the data ocean because it's a little bit, there's a lot of different currents, different diversities, Internet yeah. of Things, there's no data types. It's, you got to be prepared for anything. It, anything, yeah. We are, like in our situation, our M2M is uh, prepared to take any information model from a device that's coming up dynamically even. If you're not prepared for that, 
you bust it because every day there's coming out a new thing. Every day you learn there should be a new API to a thing. Yeah. A lot of new innovations and creativity people out there. Yeah. Uh, and if you do not support them, well, you're just stuck with old APIs, uh, inflexible structures, and that's not the way. So and the weather forecast for that that kind of data ocean is to use predictive analytics yeah. and technologies, right? Because Internet of Things, you, these are probes, right? Yeah. And regarding the, the, the lake and the ocean, I believe, if you really look how much value I get of the data, then you also question yourself, shall I store it? Right now, I have the feeling we store everything, and we burn a lot of money, energy, and, and compute, and, and the storage uh, capability with that. I think in the future, we will be a little bit more sensitive what makes sense. Yeah. I don't know what about you, but I, yeah, I, I can go back to my emails from uh, first emails I wrote in uh, at the university time. I still have it in my backup. But, but it's the wrong really format. How do you get it? How do you get it? Yeah, you it's a text email. email that's easy. You put that right? in the lake. That's where you put the lake. Yeah, yeah. You put all of the lake, right? You put so all of the lake. Duke is the Duke's hate, they said. <laughs> well, you can surf waves on the ocean, and, and that's a good thing. You surf, yeah. Yeah. You surf the waves on the, the ocean. The lake is a little bit more... The lake yeah. is more reliable. You put yeah. it in the lake and you and surf the ocean. It's, so it's fresh water. You can drink it. <laughs> <laughs> you drink value from the lake, and you surf the yeah. waves on the ocean. Okay, data ocean, data lakes, we're here. Breaking it down, I'm John Furrier with Stefan. Thanks for coming on, VP of Engineering, Bosch. Uh, great to have you. Again, Data Ocean the tr is trending on Twitter. Uh, we'll be tracking this. Uh, we'll be right back after this short break.